Voices from Oxford is here at Corpus Christi College today talking to the President, uh, Professor Steve Cowley, FRS. Steve is a, a very eminent theoretical physicist who's uh, made his early name in making very clever calculations on turbulence in, in plasmas and how heat's transferred in them, and has been the director of the Cullum Research Laboratory and then the, uh, the head of the UK Atomic Energy Authority before coming here to be president, I think, in 2016. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Steve. This was your college where you were an undergraduate, I think, in physics a couple of years before? Yeah, just a couple. Yeah, just a couple. Is, is, mm -hmm. is it slightly odd or just a pure pleasure to come back? What, what well, changes it, do you see? It's a great pleasure. Um, I distinctly remember um, a <laughs> night, the, my last night in Corpus uh, when I was a student, because it was the Corpus Ball that year. Mm. And I stayed up all night, and in the very early morning, I sat on the wall at the back, staring out at, at Christchurch Meadows, thinking, mm -hmm. well, this is it. This is the last time. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't. So Fantastic. I, I'm Fantastic. back. Um, I think the values that um, the founders of the colleges at Oxford espoused um, are sort of eternal values. Mm. And it's not hard to buy into those. Yeah. Um, Corpus was founded by a guy called Richard Fox, who was Bishop of Winchester, before that Lord Privy Seal to Henry the Seventh, and his ideas about what he wanted the college to do mm. pretty resonant now, five hundred years later. It's extraordinary. I mean, the society has changed so much in five hundred years. The circumstances in which it was founded, and yet the sort of the principles, the values still have relevance, in fact, more today perhaps than ever. What, what, I think how do you reinterpret I think that's true. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was founded at a time everything was, um, uh, everything was very much a religious based. Yes. And yet, he wanted the new learning. And he wanted people to learn uh, the ancient languages, um, Hebrew, Greek, yeah. um, as well as Latin. Um, and he wanted mathematics and astronomy, um, which made Corpus quite a modern yeah. institution at that yeah. time. Um, but I think it's not what people were learning, as, as it is now really, it was that through learning um, we can illuminate our lives um, yes. in ways that without learning we will never access. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm a scientist and, and part of that illumination is also about um, a, about making things that you know cure diseases sure. and, and sort out the world's energy problems and do these kind of so things. So it can be useful. But it can be there's useful. There's more than that, isn't there? But um, just knowing, you know, how the universe works yeah. as a physicist is really the reason most of us do yeah. physics. That's true in biology too. I have to say. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And, it, and and being useful is a, is a useful side product, if you, if you like, of, of that. It's a it's a good thing. But it's yes. not necessarily the only thing that's motivating us. So. Yeah, I think that's right. I think um, all the people that I found who are really successful in science are not are not constantly thinking, you know, is this useful? They're mm -hmm. just thinking, I'd really like to know mm. how that works, why it's so, you know, all these beautiful little details about nature yeah. that um, we spend our lives puzzling over. Yeah, um, it, it, it's it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, we're on the same page then. Of course, we've, we and our predecessors have had to have a dialogue with our societies about funding this sort of work and allowing this sort of work to carry on. And partly that's a dialogue about how we can be useful as well as this. Do you think this, uh, this is a more difficult conversation to have at the moment, given that the world is quite a turbulent place? Or, or are you hopeful that uh, we can uh, persuade our, our colleagues in society that this is a, a worthwhile endeavour. We're at a difficult point and everybody is distracted. Yes. Right. So people are distracted partly by Brexit, they're distracted partly by Trump mm. um, and all these sort of political forces. I don't think the core arguments, however, are on the importance of uh, funding people to think deeply mm and to change the world mm. uh, have ever been um, stronger felt. Uh, partly because of things like the tech industry yes, and people who have, um, it sounds a bit grubby, but made their fortune 
out of thinking. Mm. Um, and their understanding and their appreciation for more thinking. And that's, I, I find people from the tech industry extraordinarily interested in classics. Yes. yes. Because, because they're just people who think. And once yes. you start thinking about one thing, your mind gets trained to, to enjoy thinking and then other things become, yes. you know. And this is actually key, I think, also in Oxford. No other university, but perhaps a little bit that one in the fens, but um, <laughs> no other university uh, brings people together in the way. Yeah. The that, college community has that interdisciplinary sort of right. glue, doesn't it? And through that, you get to argue about all kinds of intellectual and and interesting things. Mm. And you don't even think of it as intellectual conversations. I try to go into brunch with the students at the weekend. Mm. Um, they're, they're most vulnerable. <laughs> um, but the, I, one of the things about it is that, um, you know, they're having conversations mm. about very interesting things mm. all the time, mm. even over, um, you know, overcooked bacon on a, mm. on a Sunday morning. Um, and, I, and I guess it's, I mean, I, I think of it as being true in biology, but it's probably even truer and more natural in, in the sort of physics that you do, that you end up with asking these big questions that are at the edge of your subject and where you know, philosophers and, and other thinkers can have input and engage right. in the discussion, even if not necessarily the, the details of the calculations or what have you. Is that, is, that, is that, do you think, true for all academic subjects? Yeah. Um... Uh, you know, I'm a physics chauvinist, right? Um, he, the famous quote from Lord Rutherford was <laughs> that, you know, science is either physics or stamp collecting. Yeah. Um, has a little resonance with me. Um, not, I, I, we, won't, we won't agree on that. We won't agree on that, no. No, I, I, I am a physicist who spent my life working on practical issues, exactly. even though I'm a theoretician. Yes. Right. Um, so I understand the joys of all kinds of science, yeah. and there's nothing, you know, there's nothing uh, in in the general kind of physics I do. I'm understanding how the universe works, but I'm not probing mm. something that some physicists do, mm. and that is what are the fundamental laws yeah. by which the universe works. Mm. Um, I do think of that as a kind of higher purpose. Mm. It's just not what I've spent my career doing, and I mean, all do that one thing. yeah, and 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 also, to be honest, one of the dangers of that is an awful lot of bright people get sucked into it mm. and produce nothing out of it because because once a century, an Einstein comes along and changes the whole picture, and we all know about these sort of ideas of paradigm shifts. Yes. Um, it'd be wonderful to be Einstein, yeah. um, and I think you know changing. The, our understanding of the laws of nature would be absolutely fantastic, but I can enjoy just the the sweetest little detail of of my science that doesn't have to be profound in that level. It yeah, just has to be, exactly. just has to be there. So stamp collecting is not such a bad idea. Yeah, I like the stamp collecting. Yeah. 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 So talking earlier about how things are changing, and of course one of the big changes that's been happening, I think, in the last decade or two, has been the expansion of basic research across really good new institutions or old institutions being founded around the world, particularly in Asia, I'm thinking. Mm. Uh, you know, we thought up till now of the, the main centres being the USA and, 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 and Europe, but there's some tremendous expansion and enrichment going on in, yeah. in, in, in other universities. Isn't there? How do you see that playing out is, in, in terms of our role in the world or in terms of science generally? I like it for many, many reasons. Mm. First of all, you know, having other people discover things is almost as much fun as doing it yourself. Yeah. And so I, I just enjoy that the pace of science is really great at the moment. And, and that's partly because we've got more of the world participating. Mm. The second thing is I think that uh, the participation in science globally mm. is a global unifier. Mm. I think one of the things yeah. uh, at the fall of the Soviet Union there's a lot of work of people out of my field mm. who had great contacts into the Soviet Union mm. prior to the fall of the Soviet Union. And if you look at some of the key advisors to Gorbachev mm. at the time that this was all going on, they came out of the science community. Yeah. Um, because the, w one of the things that the scientists told me 
was that because you travel as scientists, because you have connections to people in other, mm. other worlds, you don't necessarily believe the propaganda of your government, right? Because you know people, mm. and you know they're not like the government is saying mm. they are. And you're making those connections. Mm. And because of this shared set of values about science and, yeah. and truth... And you're trained to question. And, right. Uh, you already have a basis for, you know, a cooperation, even though the cultures you come from may be very different and the governmental systems may be very different. So there are many reasons why the globalization of science is, uh, is great, but one of them is just that it brings people together in, in, in a special way. It's not the only way people come together, but it's, it is a special way. That's a really quite an optimistic sort of uh, vision for the future, isn't it? What do you think this means for Oxford? What can... What's Oxford's role in the next century in making sure that our society has those same values at its heart and moves forward with the rest of the world? Do you think we've got a special role or are we just another organisation? I think we have a special role if we grab it. Right. And I think part of grabbing it will be to... We're in a, a xenophobic... Uh, world at the moment, yeah. with politicians exploiting people's fears uh, in ways that are very are not constructive, mm. and I think we have to stand against that, mm. and we have to stand very visibly against it and say that Oxford is not uh, a great university now by being turning inwards on its you know traditions etc., but by looking outwards. By honouring its traditions and others' traditions too, mm. you know, making it a world university, which I believe it is, but I believe that that is a not tenuous but but vulnerable position, given the the way the world is at the moment. And if we just go back to training the children of you know upper middle class white English people mm. at Oxford. Um, the university will be a lesser place. Um, so it's up to us to make sure this doesn't happen? I think it is, yeah. Great. Yeah. Steve Cowley, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Oh, you're very welcome.